So the promise of God that was here in Abraham is now given through the offering of Christ. Okay, so that's the Abrahamic covenant. Then we come to the Mosaic covenant. And of course, we've got Mount Sinai and we've got scary Moses up here with lightning holding up the law. That's the first time he gave the Ten Commandments. And then, of course, because they had the golden calf, you add more, so that's Leviticus. And then they messed it up again in Baal Peor. And so we have even more law. That's the book of Deuteronomy. Okay, so God gives the law to Moses on Mount Sinai um, with great uh, power. But there's problems with it because of our sin. And so it needs to be corrected. So where Moses goes up Mount Sinai and gives the law, Jesus goes up the Mount of Beatitudes and gives the Beatitudes, which correct all the problems in the old law. The old law had laws for divorce as well as for revenge. And Jesus gives laws saying, no, there's no such thing as divorce. In the beginning, it was not so. He also says you need to love your enemies. So he corrects the laws of vengeance, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. He says, you have heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I say, love your enemies. Poof. So he's changing the law and making it perfect. He's eliminating the imperfections of the law and making it perfect in himself. And whereas before, the Mount Sinai was a place where they covered their faces in fear because it was so terrifying, the Mount of Beatitudes is a peaceful place because the Prince of Peace has come. So his law brings peace, right? So very cool. But we also see Moses gave bread from heaven, although it wasn't really Moses, was it, that gave bread from heaven? We heard that, right? Who gave the bread from heaven? God. Moses just like, hey, please send it. And God sends it. Moses didn't send it, right? But the fact is, is that Moses gave bread from heaven, but we hear in John chapter 6, your fathers ate that bread in the wilderness, but they died. The bread that I will give, whoever eats of it will never die. Ah, so now he's not just like Moses. He's actually better than Moses, right? And in fact, that was one of the prophecies in the Mosaic Covenant in Deuteronomy 18. It said, I will raise up a prophet like you, Moses, for the people, and they will listen to him, right? And since that time, there had been no one like Moses who saw God face to face. But of course, did Moses see him face to face? No, he only saw his back. But we see very clearly that Jesus has seen the Father face to face. He knows the Father. We've been hearing those readings in the Mass. But he also says this. He says, Philip, Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus says, have you been with me so long, Philip, that you don't know me? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. This guy's either nuts or he's God. Because nobody says that kind of stuff. That is crazy. So we have to recognize Jesus is saying something very clear. He's saying, I am God. And if you see me, you see the Father. I am revealing the Father to you. I'm not just revealing the law. Moses gave the law. The law came through Moses. But grace and truth came through Christ Jesus. We have access to the Father through him. Whereas before, we didn't. Pretty amazing, right? So there, there's a whole book that can be written on the connections between Moses and Jesus. So we have to kind of move on a little bit. But the last piece, of course, is that in the Mosaic Covenant, we have the institution of the Passover, which was the ritual covenant meal that signified and re reenacted the liberation from Egypt, from slavery. And Jesus institutes a new Passover, which doesn't liberate us from the slavery in Egypt, but slavery to sin. So it's a greater and newer Passover. We'll get into that. Okay. Okay. So now we come to the Davidic covenant, which in 2 Samuel 7, we see the promises in the Davidic covenant. So you remember, uh, we'll just go to that really quickly, just so I don't make it up. Because <laughs> I can do that, just riff on it, and you would believe me, but it might not be true. Okay. So 2 Samuel, we have the promise of God, 2 Samuel 7 and following. Okay. Right, in verse 9, it says, I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones on earth. I will appoint a place for my people Israel, will plant them. I will give you rest from all your enemies. I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body and establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish his throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. All right? Now, this, of course, was provisionally fulfilled in Solomon, but we see because of his disobedience, it's not kept. Right? So the fact is, is that we see it's kind of fulfilled in Solomon. He builds the temple, and he's good for a while, but then he ends in disgrace, and he ends in idolatry. So we realize this promise wasn't fulfilled in Solomon. It needed a better fulfillment. And so Jesus, the new Solomon, actually is obedient to the Lord in everything. Uh, he builds a new house, not of stone, that can be destroyed. But as he said, if you destroy this temple in three days, I'll rebuild it. So he builds a living house made of living stones, which is his flesh. Okay. All right, yeah, but, 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 there we go. Um, so we see that, as he said in one time when he's speaking to people, one greater than Solomon is here. 
right? So he's actually directly saying, I am the son of David, but greater, right? I am the son of David, not just one son of David among many. I am the actual one that was prophesied, that will last forever, whose kingdom and throne we establish in the temple will last forever. Okay, sound good? All right, so that is the overview of where we've been thus far. <clears throat> now we come into today. <clears throat> now we get into good stuff. Okay. Right, so last time, you remember the prophets, they were prophesying the new covenant, and we had a few details about that with the dotted lines, right? The Eucharistic covenant completes and fulfills what the prophets were talking about. The prophets foretold a new covenant in Jeremiah 31 that will be unbroken, and instead of being written on tablets of stone like the old one, it'll be written on hearts of flesh, right? So everyone will know God. It won't be something external to them. It'll be something written into their hearts. All will know me, says the Lord, Okay. This hasn't happened yet in the time of the prophets, but it happens in Christ Jesus. So now we go to Luke 22. So if you have your Bibles with me, we'll turn to Luke 22. This is a New Testament, so I know we're cheating. We're going into the New Testament. It's not the Old Testament anymore. Sorry. But it's Matthew, Mark, Luke. So it's the third gospel. All right. This is page 73 for the pagans. Okay, in the New Testament. Okay, great. Um, we come to Jesus celebrating the Passover with his disciples. And the Passover is the main sacrifice of the Old Covenant, the main sacrifice of the Mosaic Covenant. They had to celebrate it every year as a perpetual institution. So Jesus, as a good Jew, is offering this Passover, but he changes things. And this is shocking and scandalous, and the details matter. So let's, listen, let's look at them. Okay, so this is chapter 22, Luke 22, verse 14. When the hour came, he sat at table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I shall not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He took a chalice and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the chalice after supper, saying, this chalice which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Okay, so that, stop right there. So let's look at that. To understand what's going on here, you have to know how the regular Passover goes. Within a regular Passover, I wrote up here the fourth cup. There are four cups of wine that are drunk throughout the Passover meal. They each have a purpose. One starts the meal, One's for another purpose. The third cup is called the cup of blessing, where you give thanks. And then the fourth cup is the cup of consummation. So the, the fourth cup, basically at the end of the meal, you drink the fourth cup and then you sing a psalm. And the psalm is a section of psalms in the last book of the psalms we study. It's called the Great Hallel. It's a group of psalms that were sung when you go up in pilgrimage to the temple. And so this was the way you concluded the Passover meal. So it's a great Thanksgiving, a great hallelujah at the end of the Passover, okay? So, but Jesus changes this. He, he offers the third cup, which is the cup of blessing. And he says, this cup is my blood. This is the new covenant in my blood. And he says, I won't drink it again from the fruit of the vine. You, everyone needs each other. We need to rely on each other. We need to come to mass, right? Because that's the heart of everything. And then lastly, prayer, because prayer keeps us connected to him. So that's the class. There's way more, of course, uh, the last chapter of the book talks about the book of Revelation and about the sacraments, so I hope you read that. Um, really, the homework um, for Holy Week, you, we don't have class during Holy Week, obviously. Your homework has come to Mass, because I, the Masses that we have during Holy Week are so beautiful, especially Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Vigil. You're going to experience everything we've done this whole year in a few days. It's compressed, and it's beautiful, and I hope you get to come, and I hope you get to celebrate the sacraments with our candidates and catechumens that are going to be received into the church. It's going to be a really beautiful time, especially the Easter Vigil. So, uh, brothers and sisters, um, uh, maybe we'll just, because we got done just a slightly early, um, I'm going to stop right here and we can do big group questions for a couple of minutes before we split off into our CIA. So if there are any questions about tonight or about any of the classes of this last year, you can raise your hand and so we can bring a microphone out to you. You said that when Mary held Christ's body, Jesus' body, she knew he was going to die. Yes. But she didn't know how he was going to rise. 
The apostles also had heard that he was going to die, but they were desolate as well. Did they understand that he would rise? Did they really get that at that point? Uh, you know, it, it, you, you see, very good question. I don't know the psychology of each of them, but it seems to be very clear that, I mean, Our Lady, she is very much... Uh, seems to have the most understanding of any of them, although it's clear that she doesn't know all the details, right? So we're not really sure what she knew or didn't know, but she listened to her son, and so she heard the promises, and so presumably she believed he was going to rise again. But that doesn't mean it, it's any less difficult to watch your son be beat up to a pulp and killed, right, in a very brutal way, right? So, but the other apostles, we see very clearly, they're like, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, well, we heard our women say he rose from the dead, but we don't know what to make of that. It's like, you guys are so dumb. I told you so many times, right? That, that, that seems to fit the picture of the disciples because they're really dumb until this happens to them. So I wouldn't be surprised if like, it just went in one ear and out the other, to be honest. Yeah. But that's not dogma. You can take that or leave that. <laughs> other questions or any things? Got one up here. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, there and then here. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this is more for the recording. But yeah, for her first and then, and then yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, you said that eye for an eye, of the word of God was imperfect and he was fixing the imperfection. So I was wondering why the God, word of God was imperfect and then it needed fixing when you said, no, love thy enemy. Very good. You corrected me on that. Thank you. Uh, so I was imprecise in that. So obviously the word of God is not imperfect, right? Uh, the law that was given uh, was not the ideal form of the law. And this is actually good law practice because there's a sense of if someone is not able to keep the law in its ideal form, you move them in the direction of it. It's a catechetical process, right? So what we see in the Old Testament is that he gave them the ideal form of the law on Mount Sinai, right? In the Ten Commandments, right? The revenge wasn't a part of that, right? But the fact is they couldn't keep it. And so it's lowered a bit and it's given some concessions, right? And so divorce was one example of that. It was a concession. God didn't desire divorce, right? But this was something that was permitted for the time because they didn't have the grace to be able to live it, right? So it's one of those things, it's not that God is changing his mind. These are things that are given through the human concession mediation of Moses. And that's why Jesus says very clearly, right? Why did Moses, you know, I said, Moses allowed you to divorce because of the hardness of your heart. It's not God that did that. Moses allowed it because God permitted him to for the sake of trying to keep, you know, people from murdering their wives. Because that's how wicked they were, right? If he didn't have the divorce law in there, they would have killed their wives to get out of their marriages, right? So it's saying it's a better law than that, right? And so, so it's one of those things that we, we see that, that, that it's not so much that God's law needed perfecting. It's that because of our wickedness, the law became corrupted, right? Or it was lowered to the front's ideal standard because we couldn't live it, right? So Christ is saying, no, now that I'm here... You can, and in fact, he raises the bar even higher, right? He says, it's not just that you can't commit adultery, you can't even commit lust, right? It's not that you can't just murder somebody, you can't even be angry with them. So now he's not only restoring it, he's lifting it up to the next level, and he can do that because he says, if you receive my grace, you will have the ability to do that, whereas before you didn't. But that's a great point. I, I, I was imprecise in the way I spoke. Yeah. Yes? Um, I was just curious if Mary had any other children. I'm sorry? Uh, did Mary have any other children? Did Mary have any other children? The answer to that is categorically no. Absolutely not. Yeah. So when we see in the Gospels where they talk about brothers and sisters of the Lord, because there are a couple of passages that refer to that, and that's confusing for some folks, we have to first think about this. Um, Mary, uh, she's a virgin when she meets Joseph, and we see very clearly that she is the mother of the Son of God. After that experience, do you think she'd have any desire for normal children? I have never had the experience of having God live inside of me for nine months, but I'm sure that radically changed her, right? And so the fact was is that she had no intention of having children anyway. She only accepted a child because God told her to, right? So the fact is, is that Joseph knew about her promise of virginity and he was respecting that from the very beginning. So the fact is, is that no, she, she never had any other children. Now the question is whether Joseph had other children. We have different traditions within the church, and so you are free to believe what you wish. The Western half of the church believes that Joseph was also a virgin and did not have other children. Okay? The East believed that he had children by a prior marriage and was a widower. 
Okay? So they are both traditions, they are ancient, I think they're wrong, but it is an ancient tradition and so we have to respect it. We can't just simply wipe it away because the Orthodox do believe that Joseph had other children, right? The Latin rite tradition is that brothers and sisters of the Lord, um, Adelphoi in the Greek, right, is very broad. It's not just blood brothers and sisters, but we see very clearly it's also cousins or uncles, right? Because there's not so much of a distinction that happens there. So, so that's the way the West is interpreted. These are the cousins of the Lord. We see very clearly because James is the brother of the Lord, and we know clearly that he is a cousin. He is the son of Alphaeus, who is the cousin of Mary. So we see very clearly, or the, the brother, you know, uh, so Clay, uh, uh, yeah, I forget exactly off the top of my head, you're catching me, but essentially, yes, so James, we know he is the son of, of Alphaeus, who is uh, brother, sister with, with Mary, okay, does that make sense? So, so we, we know already one of those examples where it's called the brother of the Lord, but it's actually a cousin, so the West has just always said, the Latin Rite Church has always said the rest of them are just cousins. The Chosen gets this, I think, wrong, by the way, you know, just to let you know. So if you're like, the Chosen, the Chosen's pretty good in a lot of ways, but they kind of leave it ambiguous. So just so you're, if you're watching, like, they're kind of like, mm, I don't know, but, but we know. Okay, <laughs> so little, little, James, little James is actually the cousin of the Lord, right? So they get that wrong, but there you go. Anyway, they're trying to do things for dramatic effect. They can't get everything right, and they're Protestants. So there you go. Okay, but there you go. no judgment here. Anyway, so. It's just, the, it's just the, they're trying to leave it as open as they possibly can for a lot of people to enjoy the show. And so they, they leave certain interpretations open, which I'm glad they haven't like rocked solid, like, you know, fallen there. But just be aware of that, that, that it is not the Bible. It is a dramatic interpretation. They get several things very right. I, I very much, I love the relationships they have with people um, between the disciples, but the timeline's off and there's other problems with it. So just take it with a grain of salt and enjoy the show. Anyway, sorry. Tangent, sorry, squirrel, back. Okay, so. <laughs> All right, uh, we're, we're, we're at time for the RCIA. Folks, I know they have things that they would like to do, unless they want to stay here and want to change the plans. But anyway, so we'll, we'll dismiss uh, RCIA folks. Um, you can go uh, with, with um, formators. Um, if others want to do uh, small groups, they can, or they can stay in here for a big group uh, conversation to continue for a little bit, and then we'll do some prayer together. So whatever you'd like uh, to do. We'll, we'll uh, start again in like a minute, give them time to go. Okay, were there other questions people wanted to ask? over the whole year, over tonight, over anything you wanted to ask. Yeah. Okay. So how many of you that was like first time hearing that all tied together? What do you think? kind of interesting this stuff really changed my life like when I saw all the the pictures and tying it together and going through it uh, this was the stuff I was like where was this my whole life so I hope it's blessed you um, I know for some of you it's a long day after school and other things so I, I appreciate you guys being patient and, and and listening you know during this time but but realize that if you didn't get it through the first time it's okay it's why we recorded it and also, the book is, is really good. So if you didn't get a chance to pick up on things, the Bible Basics book is really good that goes through, hits the highlights of, of all this stuff. I went in way more detail than the book goes into on certain parts. But, 
but I, I hope it blesses you. Um, I've, I've used this all the time. I've like drawn pictures on a napkin when I'm trying to share the story of salvation. So uh, if you commit these pictures to memory, it helps. It's a great way to try and keep all the details uh, together of the main storyline of the Bible, right? So if you really want to test yourself to see if you learned it, see if you can draw all seven pictures, okay? That's, that'd be a good, it'd be a good test to say this, if I really interiorized it, then I can kind of draw it out and sketch it. So from Genesis to Jesus, just what's going on, okay? Good. A couple of announcements, um, and that is, is that uh, this is our, our last uh, class before, before Easter. After, after Easter, we've got a uh, night of hope and healing, so that'll be the week after Easter, and then we're going to have our Easter potluck. So that'll be kind of our way to celebrate uh, the class and just what we've done, and then we're going to start kind of a new topic series after, after that. So, so this, this part of it is concluded, right? But, but we're going we're gonna to be doing other topics to kind of get ready for the sacraments and, uh, and prayer, because really those are, those are topics we all kind of need to grow in, yeah? Okay, so that's, that's kind of what we're going to focus on after Easter. Um, no questions, huh? None whatsoever. I've got one over here. Okay. Maybe. Lauren's back. back. Boop, come on. I'm still unclear on the celebration of the Passover, how Jesus fulfills that. So then we don't celebrate the Passover anymore. Yes. We celebrate mass as a replacement of the Passover. Yes, very good, yeah. So I didn't necessarily tie that together as well, maybe. But yeah, no, the new and everlasting covenant replaces the old covenant. And so Jeremiah is talking about there'll be a new covenant because the old one's been broken, right? Um, and so Jesus at the Last Supper, one of the details I left out was after he, 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 says, he says, do this in remembrance of me, right? And, and the fact is when he says doing it, he's not just saying do this to remember me. In, in, the, in the Hebrew, what he's actually saying, do this as a memorial offering. That's really what the sense is. And so the Passover was a memorial offering that was ordered to be done every year. Otherwise, you were cut off from the covenant, right? So when Jesus is saying, I'm celebrating the Passover and now do this as a memorial offering, he is now intentionally replacing the old Passover with this Passover that he's celebrating right now. So that's, that's and then we see him saying in Luke, uh, whoop, where'd it go? What happened to my Bible? Where'd it go? Oh, there you are. There's no sense in me making it up. I can just read it. Um, I tend to do that. Okay. All right. So this is also in Luke right afterwards. Luke 24 uh, sorry, Luke 22, uh, verse 24, a dispute arose among them, which of them was to be regarded as the greatest, right? So the disciples are always fighting about this. Isn't that fun? It's like, they're very human, right? So, and he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. Those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather that the greatest among you become the youngest, the leader as one who serves. You are those who have continued with me in my trials. As my father appointed a kingdom for me, so do I appoint for you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So that, what he's doing right there is he says in literally in the Greek, as my father covenanted a kingdom to me, so I covenant a kingdom to you that you may eat and drink at my table and sit on thrones. Remember when King David had welcomed people to his, to his house from the, from the house of David, Mephibosheth, remember him? He had the lame feet, right? And he said, you will always have a place at my table, right? So that was a sign that you were part of his family, right? So what Jesus is saying here, he's the new son of David. He's saying, I covenant the kingship to you and you can now eat at my table, right? So the mass is in fact that place where we have communion with the new son of David, no longer with the old Passover, which is now past, but now the new Passover, as we see this very clearly in Paul's letters, he says, our Passover has been sacrificed, right? Christ is the new Passover. So he's very clearly saying the old one has gone away. The old one was a shadow preparing us for the real one that is Christ. The Passover lamb was a symbol. The, a lamb can't save us. Like, that was the thing. It's like, they're looking at this and they're like, how is it that a lamb's body can save us? How can a lamb's blood save us unless it's pointing to the future to something else? And that something else is someone else. It's Jesus, who is the true Passover lamb. So why would you celebrate the shadow when you have the real thing? That's, that's, the, that's, that's the short answer. There's, there's like books on that. So that's not like a, a short question. Yeah. Good. Great. 
Oh, got, got one back there. Yes. I suppose I have two questions. I'm oh, curious. that's not acceptable. I have one. <laughs> yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah. The first one, I'm curious, just curious, why did God choose the Jews and not another group? Oh, cool, sir. I can't hear you. Yeah. Why did, why did God choose the Jews and not another group? And secondly, there seems to have been a couple, at least, instances where God was angry, greatly angry with the Jews, yet Moses was able to persuade him to take maybe a different action than he was originally going to take. Yes. How is that possible? Very good. Great question. So first question, why you choose the Jews? It's a reason known only to God, right? It's just part of the story, you know, saying God chooses what he wishes. How can the clay say to the potter, what are you making, right? It's just saying he chose, he has reasons, and it fits with the story that God is writing, right? So it, and that's, that's why it's really important to say it wasn't because they were smart, <laughs> It wasn't because they were better looking. It wasn't because they were holier. He chose them to make an example of them that even if you guys are ding-dongs and you keep disobeying me and doing this other stuff, you're still my people. That gives us a lot of hope, doesn't it? Because even if you've messed up, even if you have not lived the greatest life, if you come back to him, he'll take you back. That's amazing, right? So that's part of the good news, is to say that God didn't choose the strongest or the best. Because if, if you were writing the story, like, an amazing people, God chose them, and it was so good. You know, it's like, no, this people was really a mess, right? So that's the first answer, I would say. The second one is, uh, is more that the word of God is given to us mediated through human language. That may sound strange, but it's saying the word of God, we have to be able, God is incomprehensible to us without help, right? I mean, God is so far beyond our understanding to understand what he's saying to us, God has to provide a way for us to understand. And so there are particular idioms or ways of speaking to communicate ideas, but they're imperfect, right? So, so the fact is God can't get angry. We know that for a fact because God doesn't have emotions. God simply is, right? So God is not like one second hot and one second cold, like us. That would require time. God's outside of time. You realize the amount of time I've been talking, right? You know, it's like it takes time to be able to speak like this, right? God is outside of time. So we don't know what that's like. So he doesn't have different emotional states. He just simply is. He's pure being. So the fact is, what does it mean when we hear that God gets angry or God gets uh, sad or, or God, you know, it's, it's human ways of talking about God. It's anthropomorphizing, right? We're trying to express something that's ineffable. The fact is that God doesn't change his mind either because that would require time to do. <laughs> God simply is and everything is, he is doing is. It's not like, oh, I, I changed my mind. No, no, he just, he, his, he, he's just pure being and he just, he, he, pure, pure act, right? So anyway, so there, there's no potential in God to change. It's all actualized, right? So. So the fact of the matter is, is that what is God doing? He's teaching us something, right? On those examples you mentioned with Moses, he's teaching Moses something, right? He's trying to see if Moses has got the idea because everybody else doesn't got the idea, right? Everyone else has abandoned the covenant. Everybody else is disobedient. And he says, hey, Moses, look at these people. They've abandoned the covenant. Like, they can't get it right. I'm going to swipe them all out and start over with you. If Moses would be like, sounds good to me, God, eh, you fail, <laughs> Right? Because Moses, he's trying to test his memory. The other people have terrible memories, right? They can't even remember like 40 days ago. Like God appeared on the mountain, and now Moses went up the mountain. Forty days later, they're offering a golden calf. Like you're like, guys, you can't even last 40 days? What's wrong with you, right? So he's trying to see if Moses remembers. And Moses passes. He recalls what God has said. He said, hey, God, remember how you're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And God's like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you remember how you promised that you would, you know, take this... Yeah, I did say that, you know. God knows all this stuff. It's not news to him, right? But through the exercise of Moses speaking it out, God is teaching him, right? So, so it's one of those it's divine pedagogy. It's not that God changes his mind. It's that through this exercise, Moses is stepping into his role as an intercessor. He's showing himself to be a faithful and merciful high priest in imitation of Christ. He's a type of Christ who intercedes on behalf of a sinful people who don't deserve mercy and he begs mercy from the Father. So he becomes in that moment a reflection and an image of Jesus. All of these things in the Old Testament, when they don't make sense, we have to 
first ask the question, what is it actually saying? I could misunderstand what it's saying. Secondly, I have to see it in light of all of the Bible. I can't just read it in isolation. I have to see what, what does it mean in the con canonical context. That's how we've been reading things. You notice how I'll jump around from book to book to book to kind of illustrate a point? That's a Catholic way of reading the Bible. Fundamentalists will look at one book, one verse, they'll pick it apart, and they'll be like, Ding! the problem is when you focus on one verse isolated from all the other books of the Bible, you'll get some weird ideas. So if you focus on that, yeah, you get the weird idea that, well, God gets angry, or God's capricious, or God likes the death of the innocent. And it's like, no, there are literally hundreds of other verses that say he doesn't desire the death of the wicked. So what is he doing right here? It must be something different, right? So we have to be careful when we're interpreting the Bible. If we just look at one passage, we've got to really say, wait a second, how does that fit with the whole context of what's going on here? Great question, though. I mean, because a lot of atheists will use that. A lot of other folks who don't believe in God, they'll be like, hey, it seems like this God of the Old Testament is different than the New Testament one. I'll be like, yeah, God of the Old Testament is way more merciful than Jesus. And they're like, what? <laughs> yeah, think about it. All the readings we've been having here are saying, look, the Father doesn't judge anyone. He's given all judgment to the Son. Whoo! <laughs> Son's judgy. Jesus is the judge, and he's going to judge you on the last day. He says, the Father doesn't judge anyone. The Father's merciful. The Father's loving. But I'm Jesus. <laughs> you know? And my judgment is true. Right? And it's just. And he's the one who calls the Pharisees liars and, and, and snakes and, and all these other things. And you're like, holy mackerel, like Jesus is not coming to play around, right? So if, any, if anything, it's saying to God, the Old Testament's way more merciful. Like, what is God's revealed name to Moses? The Lord, the Lord, the merciful and faithful God, blessing those to the hundredth generation, those who obey him, but repaying, you know, to the third and fourth generation, those who are wicked, right? You know, so we see very clearly that, that he's way more merciful than he is just, in that sense. Oh, that's not true either. That's, 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 a, that's a heresy. He is, his mercy and justice are equally balanced. Anyway, but you get what I'm saying. Okay. There's a lot more emphasis actually on the mercy of God than there is in his divine justice. Because if he were really like the judgy, just God that we think, he would have wiped out the Jews a long time ago in the Old Testament, right? He had plenty of opportunity to do so in the desert several different times. And he said, nope, I'm not going to do it because he's merciful. And that's good news for us because we mess up a lot and we need mercy Two. Amen? Good. Okay. Yes. Other questions? Yes. Come on over here. Are we doing the same thing next year? Are we doing the same thing next year? Uh, like, no. Yes. I mean, like, the same Bible Basics book. Uh, no. Uh, it, we haven't done this class in, like, two, three years, and so... Um, I try and do it on a cycle if I can every few years. It's been a while. It's been like five years since I've done it. So um, we, we wouldn't do this exact class next year. No, that's at least not the plan at this point. Then what would we, do we, we be doing? That's a great question. And I don't know right now because I'm living in the moment right now and I'm having a hard time getting my lessons done on time. So that's my, that's my situation. But we will have something great next year. I just don't know exactly what it will be. But that's kind of a nice transition. You see these guys who are wearing these cool shirts. Uh, there's some cool stuff that's cooking uh, that they're working on, but it's not done yet, and we'll tell you what it is. Stay posted, right? But there, there will be some cool stuff that we're doing for middle and high school um, this next year, but we're not 100% sure what it is. We're working on it right now. Yeah. Great question. Got one up here? Sweet. So what did God mean when he said he's a jealous God? Very good question. What did God mean when he's a jealous God? So... We oftentimes use words interchangeably, but they don't really mean the right thing, okay? So jealousy is different than envy. Do you know the difference between those two things? So jealousy is you want something that you don't have, right? Envy is you want it so bad, you hope the other person gets hurt so you can have it. Or you, you can't have it and you don't want them to have it either. Does that make sense? So envy is the sin, right? Because envy is desiring evil toward your neighbor because they have something you don't have, right? So that's jealousy. You know, jealousy is like, can be a holy thing. If you look at somebody and say, man, I wish I was like them because they, they're really virtuous, they pray a lot, whatever. That's a, if it inspires you to do better, that's a holy jealousy, right? If it causes you to just envy them, be like, man, I, I hope they trip, you know, <laughs> like, oh, whatever, you know, or, or I, I bet it's all a show, I bet they're really hiding some deep, dark secret, and they're really not so good, right, you know, and, oh, I, I hope I'll look for reasons to expose them, that's envy, right, 
Jealousy is really saying, man, one day I want to grow up and be like him. That's the, that's the good sense of it, of being like, okay, I'm inspired then to move. So when God says, I'm a jealous God, he's saying, I made this person and I want them for myself, right? I'm not happy that they're far away, right? He's not wishing evil on us, that'd be envy. He's like, but I'm a jealous God, I want them for myself. And that shows something interesting. It's like everything belongs to God, but yet for some reason, we have the ability to say no to him. Isn't that wild? There is literally nothing else in the universe that can say no to God, but we can. What then are we? We're kind of a unique creature, aren't we? That we have freedom to be able to say yes to God who made us, or we can say no to him. And boy, oh boy, we better think about what that means, <laughs> right? So, so it's a great question. Again, it's, 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 it's that term called anthropomorphizing. You ever heard that word? You know what that means? It's like, it's we're putting human characteristics on God, right? Or upon other things. It's like when you watch a Disney movie like Pixar, we're anthropomorphizing the fish. It's like Dora, like, <laughs> you know, it's like she behaves like a human being, but she's a fish, right? You know, so it's like, yeah. So anyway, so, so yeah, that, that, that's, that's an idea. We, because God is so different than us, we try and make him like us so we can understand him, but he's beyond our understanding, which is why it's so amazing that God took on a human nature so that we didn't have to start putting human characteristics on him anymore. We could actually see what he's like. That's why he says, if you've seen me, Philip, you've seen the Father. Because if you look at Jesus, you can see what God is like. Because he is God. And man, both together. Great question. Other questions? These are great questions, guys. Like, uh, any, anything else? Cool, we got one over there. Yeah. Bringing into theory such as the multiple universe theory, does that mean God would be like the God of other universes? And would that mean there would be multiple gods? Great. Also, wait, Great. and another question. Yeah. Bringing in the fact that there's probably alien life on another planet, does that mean he's also the God of those? Great questions. So, so let's, let's deal with each one in its, in its order, right? They're all important. So the multiverse, we don't know if that's a thing. You know, it could be a thing. We don't know if it is. If it is a thing, God would be the God of all universes, right? So is it possible? Sure. Uh, is it likely? No. Because they invented the multiverse to get around the idea of being God, there being a God. Now we have to ask aliens, is there alien life? The answer is yes. They're called angels. We've always known that there are aliens. They are not humans. They are interdimensional beings <laughs> that control the forces of the universe. The church has always believed in these things, right? So the fact is, is that we're like, oh, there's intelligent life out there. Yes, it's way more intelligent than you and you should be scared of it. Unless if it's good, right? There are good angels and there are bad angels. And in fact, you have a guardian angel. You have an alien watching over you. You have a guardian angel who is of great power and intellect protecting you because the invisible world is far bigger than the visible world. That's true. Now, the thing is, is that a lot, of, a lot of the hypotheses about different universes and other things have been come up with because people don't like the conclusions of the Big Bang because the Big Bang actually show there's a beginning to the universe. And if there's a beginning, it means that before the beginning, someone had to start it. And that means there's a God. And they don't like that idea, so they come up with, well, maybe there's many other universes and many other, you know, and so they're trying to get away from the problem, but it doesn't solve the problem. You still have to get the idea of when did that start? Well, it's just, it never, it always, it always, other things are exploding and imploding and, and vibrating and, you, and it keeps on. You're not answering the question, right? So we have to really challenge some of these things and say, yeah, it could be true. Mathematically, it's interesting. Um, if it's true, we'll figure it out of how to reason it, right? Because when we've made new, dis new discoveries, we figure out how to integrate the gospel into them. But the fact is, is that I'm not holding my breath because I don't think it, it'll happen. Now, I could be wrong in that because it's not a point of revealed faith. I don't know the answer to that. But I do know this, that the Lord Jesus is the Lord of all, right? Of all possible universes and of all possible worlds. And his sacrifice is all sufficient because God is infinite and he's offered something that's infinite. And so it has infinite satisfaction. So if there are other aliens and they have souls and whatever, okay, fine. They're redeemed by Christ too.
there you go. Not difficult, right? However, I, I think most of the time when people came up with aliens or other universes or other things, it's because they rejected the teaching on angels and they rejected the teaching on the creator, right? So they try and come up with other ideas, right? So just be, be aware of that. So just take things with a grain of salt that people aren't so sure of certain things as they think they are. But yeah, we do believe in aliens and they're called angels. Yeah. And it's, there's way more kinds of angels than there are things in the visible universe because every single angel is its own species and its own genus because it doesn't have a body. Isn't that amazing? So if you think there are billions and billions and billions and trillions of angels, every single one is a completely unique species. Yeah. Uh, how does the Bible describe the angels? How does it describe the angels? Yeah. Great question. So we've got actually a great description of some angels in Ezekiel in the beginning. All right. So this is in Ezekiel uh, chapter 3, verse 12. The Spirit, this is Ezekiel, he's having a vision in the Holy Spirit. So he's praying. And he says, The Spirit lifted me up. And as the glory of the Lord arose from its place, I heard behind me the sound of a great earthquake. It was the sound of the wings of the living creatures as they touched one another, the sound of wheels beside them that sounded like a great earthquake. The spirit lifted me up and took me away. I went in bitterness and the heat of my spirit, the hand of the Lord being strong upon me. And I came to the exiles at Talab, who dwelled by the river Chebar. And I sat there overwhelmed among them seven days. Okay. Uh, and then, blah, 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 blah. let's see, where'd it go? Oh, for crying out loud. Where'd they go? Anyway, so there's wings. Oh, there we go. Oh, it's actually in chapter one. There we go. So, so as I looked, as in chapter one, Ezekiel chapter one, verse four said, as I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, a great cloud, brightness, and fire flashing forth. In the midst of the fire were gleaming bronze. From the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures. This was their appearance. They had the form of men, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot. They sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. The four had faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. And everyone went straight forward without turning as they went. Now, this is a weird description, right? You're trying to picture that. I'm like, that is bizarre, right? The reason is because angels don't have bodies. And when we have a spiritual vision of them, our brain is trying to figure it out. And we can't put the pieces together. So what we're seeing is symbolic things that he's trying to represent to us, right? But angels you can't describe with physical language because they're non-physical beings, right? So anytime an angel appears on the earth, they're taking on some kind of matter to reveal themselves to us because they don't have matter to reveal to us, right? So when he's describing this, it's like, okay, if they have four faces, it means they look in all four directions and you don't have to turn your head. So that means they have all seeing, right? then they can move forward wherever they go. So the fact is they never have to turn, they just immediately go whatever direction they want. So they're completely agile. They can move anywhere instantly wherever they want to go, right? And they've, it, so, so there's, there's kind of symbolic language here that's trying to reveal an invisible truth about angels, right? There's other ones of like in the cherubim in the book of Revelation that talks about like being covered with eyes and on fire and uh, eight wings and covering, you know, and so, so it's pretty terrifying. If you send a Valentine's card with one of those, like a realistic angel, it's like, I love you, be my Valentine. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, so they're terrifying. I mean, it, the fact is, if, here's the way it describes it. Every time an angel appears, the response is people fall on their face in fear. With one exception, the Blessed Mother. Isn't that interesting? Like, all throughout the Bible, whenever an angel appears, like Joshua, when an angel appeared to Joshua, it's like, who are you? Are you friend or foe? He's like, I'm the commander of the Lord of hosts. He's like, oh my goodness, and he falls down to the floor, you know? Ezekiel, all these other people, they fall flat on their face. Daniel falls on his face. Everyone falls on their face. Jeremiah falls on their face. Everyone falls down in fear just in front of an angel. But the Blessed Mother doesn't. Because she's without sin, she doesn't have any fear. Isn't that interesting? Being sinless makes you fear less. Whoo! Man, I want some of that, right? That's great. Did you have other, other follow-up to that, or was that kind of... Yeah, cool. Great, great question. Angels are cool. Like, there's a whole field of study on angels, and it's... I, I haven't spent much time on it, but, but boy, it's really fascinating, because, yeah, they don't have bodies. So every single angel is its own genus. It's only, you know, because so, you, you, you determine differences within the genus by bodily difference, and there are no bodily differences. So the complexity of the spiritual world is so vast, you can't even possibly understand it. 
So I can understand why people come up with multiverses and stuff, trying to explain stuff, but like, it'd be way more fascinating if you just looked at angels, because they're pretty, pretty awesome to think about. Good. Anyone else? Other questions? Yeah, over here. Beep. So I remember in one of your past homilies, you talked about hell being a mercy. So could you elaborate on that? A what? So I remember in one of your past homilies, you talked about hell being a mercy. So could you uh, elaborate on that? Hell being a mercy. Yes, that's, that's a great question. So imagine this. Um, imagine you have somebody locked in a basement like, you know, somebody, somebody you, want to, you want to date somebody, you want to take them out on a date, and like, they don't want to date you, so you lock them in the basement until they say yes. Is that loving? Do you think they're going to love you more? No, because you're trying to force them to go on a date with you, right? And, it, and if they don't want to, it's not going to turn out well, right? You're not going to make them like you just by, oh, I waited out. <laughs> She'll get hungry enough, you know? It's like, no, I mean, they're going to hate you more, right? So it's the same with God. There are some people who don't like God. The fact of the matter is there's many people in our world who don't want a relationship with God. God is not going to force them to love him. Hell is giving people what they want. It's saying if you don't want God, hell is to get you as far away from God as possible. Now the, the irony of that though is when you get what you want, you realize this is really not what I want. Because it's not what I was made for. I was made for love and God is love. So if you reject God and you're separated from the source of love, then boy, that's a pretty miserable place to be. But because we have free will, if somebody has chosen and said, I hate God, I don't want him, then God is not going to force us to accept something we don't want. So hell, in that sense, is a mercy because um, otherwise, we, if, if there was no hell, people think, oh, how can there be a loving God if there's hell? The fact is, if there's no hell, it would mean God is a monster and he's forcing everyone to love him. Right? I mean, the fact is, if you force someone to love you, that is slavery. It's not freedom. So you have to have the possibility of rejecting God, although it's a terrifying possibility, but yet many people do. That maybe they're not explicitly saying, oh, yeah, I love God, but I want to do whatever I want. You see, it's the same deal, right? I either give myself to God or I give myself to my pleasures, right? So the devil is one who just says, I will not serve God. That's the demonic. He says, I won't serve God, I will serve myself, right? And there's a lot of people in the world who do that. And so if they don't want to serve God and they've trained their whole life of serving themselves instead of God, when they get to heaven, they're really going to hate it because that requires that you're fully given over to God and they've trained their whole lives to be contrary to him. So God gives us what we want and what we end up doing through our life matters. What you do in your body matters because it forms your habits, your behaviors, your thoughts and everything. Great question. That's another book too, <laughs> Helping a Mercy. Yeah, yeah. We, boom, boom. Yeah. Ryan the Harris. So to follow up on that, are we still praying for those souls that are even in hell that are worthy of our prayers? Mm, and taking that one step further, would that be we're still praying for even Judas to be? Yes. I mean, good, good question. Yes. So, so let's let's step up for a second and say, um, just because. Uh, someone is a Jew doesn't mean that they're, they're condemned, right? I mean, the fact is, is that there are many Jews, I mean, the apostles are Jews, right? And they believed in the Lord, right? The fact is, if you reject the Lord Jesus, like if you know that he's the savior and you reject him, there's no other path to salvation. So whether you're Jew, Hindu, Muslim, you know, Buddhist, or just an atheist, if you, if you, if you know that Jesus is, is real and you know that he's inviting you to follow him and you say, nope, not interested, there's no other way, right? Um, now, the question that you're asking is very interesting. Do we pray for the people who are in hell? And the answer is no, because they're no longer a part of the church. However, here's the important thing. You don't know who's in hell, and neither do I. We only know the people who are in heaven because they're canonized saints. Everyone else, we don't know. With one exception, and that would be uh, Judas, <laughs> because it's very clear that the scriptural fulfillment of prophecy is that Judas fell away and his spot is vacated, right? So the fact is people saying Judas could be saved, the reality is no. Uh, the church has taught pretty clearly that Judas is the one that we kind of know pretty clearly um, is not. But the fact is, is that um, really anybody else, we don't know what happens between the moment somebody dies and, uh, and their soul leaves their body, how much time there is still to think, how much time there still is to make choices. But the fact is once you've separated from your body, there's no more time. Once your soul is separated from your body, you 
cannot make any more choices because you need a body to make choices. You're outside of time. So, so the fact is, is that we, we, well, we don't pray for those who are in hell, but the fact is we don't know clearly who is in hell and who isn't. And so we can always err on the side of mercy to pray for the dead, right? So always, you always pray for the dead. That's what you do, right? And if somebody is in hell, the Lord will apply those prayers to the person that needs them the most. So nothing is ever wasted, right? And the fact is you praying for souls who appeared to be very lost. Like I, I know there's a lot of people that are lost uh, that I've encountered in my life in priesthood and they committed suicide or other terrible things happened. And I, even for them, I pray, right? Because I don't want them to be lost. And we know that there's a lot of mental illness kind of things. It's saying it's very serious. It doesn't look good. If they died and they knew that this was bad and they did it anyway, you know, that's a problem. But we don't know what happens in the moment that they chose that and then the moment they go to meet God. I don't know how much time there is between there. And we pray for mercy because when you pray the Divine Mercy Chapel, God can apply graces outside of time to a person at the moment of their dying. And so we always have hope for that. Always. Yeah. Arius. Um, so you said Mary was like, couldn't, can't be afraid. Was she afraid, though, of uh, Jesus dying? Mm, that's a great question. So fear, right, is an, is an emotion, right? And what's interesting is that before, if you remember in the garden, Adam and Eve, right, they had no sin, right? So there are consequences to that. We actually believe that their intellect and their feelings were united. So if they didn't want to feel sad, they wouldn't. Kind of interesting. Our, our emotions right now, they're disconnected from our mind. And so sometimes you want things physically that your mind doesn't want, right? You're like, I got to have that chocolate cake. No, I don't. Oh, I'm going to do it, you know. Or, or you know, it, you have desires for things that your mind doesn't want. Because you know they're bad for you, but you do them anyway, right? You ever had that experience before, right? That didn't happen in the garden because there was no sin. So their mind and their emotions were completely in line. So that means you didn't get sad if you didn't want to. You didn't get angry if you didn't want to afraid anything because those are reactions to things and if you have a perfectly integrated will you choose what you react to isn't that interesting so what happens with both jesus and mary because they are without sin is they don't get sad lest they want to they don't get mad lest they want to this changes things because when jesus gets angry because he wants to he's not manipulated by his emotions so whenever he gets angry, you better pay attention of what making him mad because he's choosing to show something. Or when he gets sad, he weeps at the death of his friend Lazarus. He doesn't have to cry, but he does, right? Same thing with Our Lady. Like, she weeps in compassion for her son. She weeps in compassion for us. She doesn't weep because she's somehow lacking something in herself that needs to be filled. She's weeping as an act of charity for others. And that's really fascinating. So... Does she get afraid? No, unless she wants to. So does she want to? I, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to ask her. <laughs> but, but the fact is she wouldn't get afraid of things unless she desired to, right? So she obviously has fear of God, but that's a holy fear, right? Just recognizing he made me and, and I want to love him and serve him. I don't want to displease him in anything, right? Yeah. Great question. Cool. Any others? Okay. Good. No more? You guys had great questions tonight. Thanks for that. It's really good. Was that good? Yeah. You know, uh, questions are good. Here's what I want to really just hammer home. Sometimes people think questions are a lack of faith. They're not. I love questions. Questions are what made me a priest because I found that the Catholic Church had really good answers to things. So if you have questions, ask them. Yeah, please. Yeah. So I know in, in the, I can't remember where it was, but they talk about, um, it was like a, they had a statue of a staff and, on a, and a snake. Yes. And when they prayed to it, they were healed, right? Yes, the bronze serpent, yes. <laughs> the bronze serpent. Um, what differentiates that from the golden calf? And I guess what from our statues that we have now? Very, very good. Yes. Okay. Great question. That's a whole class. But I'll try and do it really quickly. Um, so God gave a commandment, right? Don't make any graven images of God, right? So that's very clear. Why? Because God is spirit, right? And you can't represent him with physical creatures. And that's what all the other pagan groups were doing is they were worshiping creatures 
rather than the creator. So God's saying, I want you to be different from them. I don't want you to make golden calves or goats or bulls or other animals that they worshiped, right? They worshiped these animals they thought they were divine or representations of their gods. So that's why God has them sacrifice bulls and goats and sheep because the Egyptians worshiped those things. So he's saying, these are not gods. You can kill them and you can eat them. So he's having them do that over and over and over again to teach them, these are not your gods. I'm your God. This is not your God, right? So a golden calf is a problem because that's a representation of the God, right? Now, the serpent is interesting because this didn't make sense to the Jewish people either, right? Because they're like, okay, is this an image of God? No, it's an image of the thing that was killing them. And this is fascinating. It's saying, in a sense, it's making a mockery of the thing that poisoned them, the, the poisonous serpents that were going through the camp and biting them and they were dying of the poison. And so he said, make a bronze image of this serpent and put it on a pole as an act of faith in God, right? Because there's no reason looking at a bronze serpent, looking at the sign of death would bring you healing. And the Jews are like, okay, what does that mean? How does that relate to the graven images thing? Because it seems contradictory, but it's not if you think about it because it's pointing forward to something different where Jesus, I become a worm, I'm a worm and no man, right? He takes on, as it were, sin, the image of sin, nailed to a tree, and those who look at him, who look at the price of sin, are healed, if they look at him with faith, right? You see? So very clearly that image of the serpent being lifted up, we just had this reading two days ago, right? That's, that's why Jesus said, just as the serpent was lifted in the desert, when this, you will know that I am when you lift up the son of man, right? So, so very clearly that image of the bronze serpent doesn't make sense unless if you look at Jesus, right? So, so it's something in the Old Testament, you try to interpret it, it's like you get weird answers because it doesn't make sense until the light of truth comes. Yeah, but it's a type, it's a shadow. It's something you're like, that's weird, that's bizarre. And that's important when we come to things that are bizarre and weird in the Bible, we're like, that doesn't make sense in its context. St. Augustine and the other church fathers would say it's because it's pointing toward the future, toward Jesus. And it's a secret that's hidden. from. There's, that's why St. That's why Paul says, up to this day, there is a veil that lies over the face of the Jewish people, right? But when the spirit of the Lord comes, the veil is lifted and they can see what all these scriptures mean. That's why the Lord at the upper room after the resurrection, when he visits them, he then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. He said, be, peace be with you, be not afraid. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Because before then, it's all in shadow. But now, in light of the resurrection, they can see what all the prophecies were about. The road to Emmaus, right? When they're like, oh, these women, they said that Jesus has risen from the dead. We don't know what to make of it. And he's like, you guys are so slow to believe everything the Lord said. Was it not necessary this would happen? And then he explained all the scriptures to them. So if, if we had to describe what this class is, it's really Emmaus. It's really pointing out how all the old things in the Old Testament point to Jesus. And once you have that vision of it, you understand what the Bible is really about. Because without them, it doesn't make sense. Good. Any other last questions? Yeah. Where's my phone? That's perfect. When we like pray to saints and stuff, are we praying to them, God, or their connection to God? Great question. So, and I, this kind of ties in, I didn't quite get to that point, but it kind of it ties in nicely. So um, statues, images are focal points for us, right? So it's different from like an idol that like you worship. So this is a helpful point when you're talking to friends and be like, hey, you, why do you pray to the saints? Or why do you do this other stuff, right? Aren't you supposed to pray just to God? It's because we have a different understanding of what prayer is, okay? For us, Worship, like when people say praise and worship, it's actually a, a misnomer, right? For us, worship is the mass. It's sacrifice offered to God, right? So the only worship that we do is offered to God the Father. You don't offer the mass to the Blessed Mother. You don't offer the mass to St. Alice. You don't offer the mass to any of the other saints. You offer the mass to the Father. You might do it on, in honor of the saint, but you're always making the prayers in Christ through the Holy Spirit to the Father, right? So the fact is, when you're praying to a saint, that's different. Prayer is talking to someone. It's asking. Prayer is just making a request of someone. The fact is, I can, in Old English, be like, Lupe, I pray you. Would you please go get me a glass of water, right? You know? So it'd be like, I'd ask you to go get something for me, right? So prayer in that sense, you can even ask your brothers and sisters to pray for you, right? That's prayer. Like, you're praying to your brother, would you please pray for my healing, right? 
you can do that. It's not idolatry, right? You're not like, brother, I worship you. I adore you. He's like, no, no. <laughs> like, no it's a, and the fact is, it's problematic because in some old prayer books, they have that effusive language because it was the romantic period of the 18th and 19th centuries, and some of it's really flowery and gross. But anyway, that's another story. But in any case, prayer, right, is, um, prayer is simply making a request. It's asking for something, right? And the fact is, is that we believe, as the book of James, letter of James says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful indeed. Are the saints in heaven? Yes. Are their prayers powerful? Better believe it, because they're closer to him than I am, right? They've already made it. They're in heaven, worshiping God all the time.